Sci-fi buzz is buzzing with bees this week. Thousands of them. That actor Tony Todd carries inside himself as Clive Barker's Candyman. From Dark to Light, the latest incarnation of Batman, a daily cartoon from Warner Brothers. Husband and wife, Robert Silverberg and Karen Haber, authors of Lord Valentine's Castle and The Mutant Season. We'll go behind the scenes for the romantic fantasy Covington Cross. And we've got some inside buzz on the origins of those science fiction marionette matchmakers, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. Anything can happen in the next half hour. Hi everybody, I'm Mike Jarek and this is Sci-Fi Buzz. This time around, we're going to start off with a little movie horror for you. Actor Tony Todd plays Clive Barker's latest demon entitled The Candyman. Now you Star Trek fans out there might remember Tony as Kern, Lieutenant Worf's brother. Well anyway, Tony tells me that when you're six foot five like he is, and you have a voice trained in Shakespeare, these rather odd movie roles have a tendency to find you. <laughs> I guess it's because of my carriage and my height that I tend to get these um, outsized kind of individuals, you know. Um, and lately they've been very interesting. You know, I mean, Candyman is certainly one of the most interesting parts I've ever played. Well, the film Candyman does have a more interesting story than your average slasher film. But the destructive device in this one is pretty massive. So how'd you decide on the size of the hook? I mean, you went to, for a mega hook here. Yeah, well, do you think it was that big? I mean, yeah. guy, I, I, they told me it was like, I don't know, 13 inches. But they, the, what we did was we experimented with different sizes and different ways to make the hook work. I mean, when you kill people, you got to be able to know what you're doing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Flexibility. Yeah, to gut people. Bit. Well, you know, it's not just gutting now. It's, <laughs> it's like coring an apple, you know? You, do, you ever try coring an apple and getting the whole thing in one slice? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's crucial. No need to leave yet. Talking with an actor who might just become the next horror film star was a kick. That's because the movie is scary, but in person, Tony is the perfect gentleman. That is, until we started talking about the Klingons. He is Worf's brother, after all. What is the key to being a good Klingon? Hating humans. <laughs> so is the toughest part of playing Kern going through the makeup process? When, when you do a Klingon, they bring you in like three or four hours early. So I'm having these ungodly calls like at 3 a.m to get sin front and basically have rubber and glue applied to my face you know uh, they call it prosthetics but i mean it's basically <laughs> rubber and glue and uh poor michael doran has to um you know he has to submit himself to that every day yeah. and i think he was telling me that they finally came up with a a, a protective layer that goes on his forehead first is it claustrophobic well, yeah, and it's claustrophobic, but on the positive thing, I mean, you, you're in it, and you can't help but feel like this uh, omnipotent, uh, alien, uh, god-like person <laughs> who hates humans. Don't get a line. <laughs> Candyman. But the makeup for a Star Trek Klingon is nothing compared to Tony Todd's bee encounter in Candyman. You see, although I don't want to spoil the sticky plot, his Candyman character is full of bees. Now, as far as the bees go, how did they do the bees? Those must have been little robot bees or something. Stunt bees. <laughs> no, these guys, um, we had a, a bee wrangler, a man named Norman Gary, who's uh, worked. You're laughing. They, they built a uh, special um, prosthetic device for my mouth, a mouth damp. And they pour these, <laughs> these bees into my throat and then uh, burn us as well as roll the cameras. But the, the sound and the feeling of, uh, you know, the things moving in mouth is something uh, I just don't want to experience again. But I knew that it would be a moment that was, uh, you know, rare in, in film history. Well, if you're wondering how they collect all those bees, corral them after a scene is over, what they actually do is take a low-powered vacuum cleaner and suck those little creatures up. Yeah, I, I guess they don't get hurt. Well, when we come back, we are going to visit with the science fiction writers Robert Silverberg and Karen Haber and meet the cast members from Covington Cross. You are watching 
the Sci-Fi Buzz on the Sci-Fi. If you want to call our buzz board with reviews or recommendations about anything in the world of science fiction, fantasy, or horror, please do so by calling the team of Robert Silverberg and Karen Haber, the science fiction writers. It's coming up in about three minutes. But first up, a television show for lovers of romantic fantasy. Well, it just doesn't exist anymore ever since Beauty and the Beast went off the air a couple of years ago. But our staffer, Heidi Holliker here, says that there is a new show out there that has some promise. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. This season, CBS has a new, or should I say old, spin on the approach sci-fi storytellers use to comment on contemporary issues. What's the buzz on the new TV series Covington Cross? We went behind the scenes to get it. What we found was a group of very lucky actors involved in the ultimate role-playing game. Covington Cross stars Nigel Terry as an English knight raising four feisty children on his own. While it's set in the Middle Ages, the show speaks to the same moral dilemmas that confront people today. How many times have I told you? Not in the castle! The series gives the show's cast the opportunity to set up camp in an English castle and relive the days of Camelot. James Faulkner portrays Sir John Mullins, the nasty villain in the manor next door. Faulkner says reenacting 14th century life is cathartic. He believes the conflicts we grapple with in this century are simplified and clarified on Covington Cross. Life was very simple and very straightforward in that time. You know, you, you can come on and do exactly what you want to do, you know. And you could defend yourself with your private army if no one likes you. That's the beauty of playing something like that. It's very direct. So just pull it back nice and steady and just let it go. This kind of TV series is the supreme fantasy for an actor. By playing Sir Thomas's youngest son, Glenn Quinn, gets experiences most of us only dream of. I've always wanted to pick up a sword anyway and like slice someone's head off or something. So it's been, you know, came came very naturally. Just this choreography, it's like a dance. <laughs> Running around in chain mail and armor is another unique demand made on the Covington Cross Ensemble. Even though their armor is really made up of painted fiberglass, it helps keep the cast focused on the right century. But Ione Skye, who portrays Sir Thomas's rebellious daughter, admits she was originally a little apprehensive about the heavy-duty costumes. I was surprised. I thought it would be a nightmare in the armor and in the sun. It was like the one hot day in England, and I had to be wearing all of that stuff. But I was very into it. It definitely is, you know, kind of developing the role for me. If you put on a little black leather and studs, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it takes the way you move and the way you play the role. You know? there's, there's no way that you can come on and be polite and subtle. If, if you're got up like this, you know, you come through the door, people know what you're about. <laughs> It's too early to tell whether or not TV audiences will recognize their own lives and problems in a medieval setting, but the actors who have created Covington Cross are having a ball living this fantasy existence. You know, it has a real relevance, so it's, it's, but at the same time, it's a different world. It's a wonderful, strange, magical world. and I'd really like to recommend the Star Trek exhibit at the National Air and Space Museum. It's a really hot exhibit, and uh, you should all go. Hi, this is Mike Barron calling from Long Island. I just wanted to remind everybody that Critters 4 is coming out on video. And if you enjoyed Critters 1, 2, and 3 like I did, this is uh, definitely something to look out for. Science fiction authors Robert Silverberg and Karen Haber share their lives, both professionally and personally. Silverberg is the author of over 100 novels, including the widely read Lord Valentine trilogy. They began collaborating on one of his short stories, The Mutant Season, after they were married. When we were approached, uh, Byron Price, the, the book packager, said, let's make a lot of novels out of your story, The Mutant Season. And I said, my story, The Mutant Season, is, is two pages long. But he was right. He saw something there that could be developed, and it, it has been now. Yes. I think mutants are always appealing to the reader, you know. It's sort of a fas fascination of the other. You could look upon mutants as a symbol of the, the other, the, the unknown. There's a lot of mystery there, and I think with mystery you have a lot of uh, appeal. Along with the Mutant series, Karen and Bob also edit Universe, an anthology of stories published every other year. We each read the manuscripts that come in. Generally, Karen reads them first and winnows out the absolutely hopeless ones. 
But we do have disagreements, fundamental disagreements, about the quality of a story because we're coming from different places with different tastes, different generations even. I have a very clear, even dogmatic idea of what a science fiction story ought to be like. Karen is a little looser, and so we do uh, have some disagreements about what to buy. Despite those differences, Bob and Karen are in complete agreement when it comes to basic storytelling technique. If people would try to write movies in, in prose, I think they'd have a much better chance of selling. If, if the, the cinematic technique, I think, is now all pervasive in fiction. Simply show what happens, show people interacting, demonstrate the, uh, the problem and the scenery through the movements of the characters. Avoid the passive voice whenever possible. Another one of Bob Silverberg's writing partners was the late Isaac Asimov. Before Asimov's death, they worked on three books together. The newest one to be published is called The Ugly Little Boy. We wrote these, uh, mostly I wrote them because of Isaac's failing health, over a period of three or four years. The Ugly Little Boy is based on his wonderful story of the uh, little Neanderthal child who is dragged out of his own ear as part of a time travel experiment and thrown down into the 21st century. Asimov and Silverberg fans can look forward to another collaborative release, The Positronic Man, in late 93. Well, his place in science fiction was, was enormous. Uh, I won't say that he was the best science fiction writer there ever was, because I wouldn't say anybody in particular was, but a mighty influence, uh, a man whose thinking was so clear, whose style was so lucid, that there is nobody writing science fiction now who doesn't write it in a way that's influenced by Isaac Asimov. In fact, Asimov and Heinlein, between them, shaped everything that's being done today. You can't, you can't fail to follow their tradition. Uh, he was also a hell of a character and a wonderfully good-hearted man and the single most brilliant human being ever to pass through the science fiction world. Uh, an awesome figure and uh, I can't believe he's gone. Over the years, Batman has been a comic strip, a movie serial, a breakfast serial too, as a matter of fact, a television show, a very graphic novel, and of course you can't forget the two blockbuster movies. Well now, staffer Dave Garrison says that there is yet another Batman in our future. This is correct. This is an animated cartoon series, and it's sort of a mix of all the Batmans you've ever seen. But it's smart, it's full of style, and it's disguised as a kid show. We really tried to do the definitive version of Batman as far as, you know, taking all the classic elements from, from partly from the movie and a lot from the comics and uh, um, even a little tiny bit from the old TV show, you know, in terms of like the wacky humor in some of the episodes, especially with the Joker and stuff. Passing your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> Eric Radamski and Bruce Tim are two longtime comic book fans who just happen to be two of Warner Brothers' top animators, whose boss, executive producer Gene McCurdy, just happened to give them the assignment of a lifetime. Turn Batman into the richest, most dramatic cartoon since Max Fleischer's world-class animated Superman of the 1940s. Well, our biggest inspiration is the comics. You know, we try to stay as faithful to the comics as possible. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at the series and they say, oh, it's obviously influenced by the movie. Well, we really weren't influenced by the movie. In fact, when we first started, um, when Eric and I were first offered the job, we told Gene, we said, well, we'll do this show, but not if you want us to make it a carbon copy of the movie, because it'll just look like a cheap ripoff, and we don't really necessarily want to do what's already been done. What Eric and Bruce came up with is a film noir world, populated by interesting, if somewhat eccentric, people. Even given the limited animation the budgets of television require, some of the action is really breathtaking. One of Eric's favorites is a game of cat and bat played on the rooftops of Gotham. It really is really uh, quite exciting, especially for me. Every time I see it, I, I kind of take a breath when she leaps off the building and you just reveal the city below and she just falls and doesn't even look back. Catwoman is just one of the returning villains familiar from the former incarnations of Batman. There's the Joker, voiced by Star Wars' Mark Hamill. Clean up your act, Joker. Oh, that's a joke, right? Batman finally told a joke. <laughs> well, we kind of play him as almost a, a manic, depressive schizophrenic, um, which is something that was in the original Batman script that 
was a, a change by the time they got to the film, or, or a little bit changed once Jack Nicholson, you know, came on board. You'll also see the penguin, Mr. Freeze. Freeze! That's Mr. Freeze to you. The guy says some of the most fun, though, is working with elements of the Batman myth that haven't been explored before. What was really fun about Batman was that a lot of the, the, the really best villains from the comics were never ever translated into another medium. You know, there was a character called Two-Face that goes way back in the comics to like the, the early 40s. Uh, it's one of the best Batman, Batman villains and was never ever done for the TV series or for the movies or whatever. As far as I know, he was never done in a cartoon before. Casting the voice of Batman was a particular challenge. We had heard, you know, tons of people coming in and doing Clint Eastwood. The part went to Kevin Conroy, who can be seen on another Fox show, Rachel Gunn RN. Is that all it was for? Maybe not. I heard gunfire. Occupational hazard. He did that voice, and everybody in the in the in the control room just kind of went, "Wow!" Yeah, the women, especially, you know, there was like there was like two women there, and one of them was the uh, the voice director, Andrea Romano, and they were like going, "Wow, he's got a great, sexy voice." Don't be silly. You can't deny there's something between us. You're right, and I'm afraid it's the law. The dynamic duo of Eric and Bruce is currently getting a 70-minute animated Batman movie ready for the home video market. And for now, they're just happy their version of Batman is meeting with such a warm welcome. The very first episode that we ran on Saturday morning was like um, Fox's highest rated program in, in uh, Saturday morning ever. So, so far we're doing pretty good. And also what was really nice was that uh, the first show, even though it was on at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, 61% of our audience was adults. So that was, you know, a real pleasant surprise. Here are some sci-fi best bets we discovered that you might want to check out. A fascinating six-part series, Space Age, premieres October 12th on PBS. The first episode is Quest for Planet Mars. What do we seek from the planet Mars? What might we find? Narrated by Star Trek The Next Generation's Patrick Stewart, the series attempts to bring the adventure and excitement of space exploration into viewers' homes. And judging by what we've caught a glimpse of, mission accomplished. In the electronic arena, Virgin Games has recently come out with Dune, a role-playing game based on David Lynch's futuristic flick. On the barren desert planet of Arrakis, players search out Fremen tribes to rally to their cause and fight the evil house of Harkonnen. Dune is currently available for IBM PCs and compatibles. And those are this week's Sci-Fi Best Bets. Hi, this is Mark Rainey from Death Realm Magazine, and I want to tell you about uh, the best of Death Realm, a uh, paperback book that's going to be hitting the shelves uh, in October or November. Uh, it'll be uh, at shops all over the country, and it's going to be available from Tangram Publishing in Belfast, Maine. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Cindy from Washington, D.C., and I'm calling to recommend Arthur C. Clarke's latest paperback. It's called The Garden of Rama, sequel to Rama 2. It's a really great read. They're puppets that sweat, smoke, bleed, and swill martinis. They're the smaller-than-life heroes of the universe of super marionation. They're next when Sci-Fi Buzz reconnects. Marionettes than Jerry Anderson himself. You see, unlike Jim Henson, Anderson kind of backed into a puppet dynasty that's taken on a life of its own. When Dire Straits filmed their video, Calling Elvis, they could have utilized any cinema breakthrough, from computer animation to claymation to audio animatronics. Instead, they chose Super Marionation. Like millions of other kids in America and Great Britain, Mark Knopfler was a fan of some of the weirdest science fiction shows ever, the marionettes of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. We are about to launch Stingray. 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 The Andersons were a small film company that got into the production of marionette films as a way of paying the bills until real work came along. The attraction to science fiction material was simple. They hated the way the puppets looked when they walked. And science fiction stories allowed them to sit in rockets, ride on conveyor belts, and hover with the aid of anti-gravity devices. Stingray was Britain's first ever color television show. It featured a 22-inch tall stud in the lead role that could out-womanize Captain James T. Kirk. 
Oh, great one. Do you require anything? Yeah. I guess you can peel me another grape. Stingray was a ripple in the water compared to the tidal wave just ahead. Scott, it's action stations. Thunderbirds are go. FAB. FAB means absolutely nothing, but it was the catchphrase of Jerry and Sylvia's most enduring creation, the Thunderbirds. Go ahead, John. I've just picked up some U.S. Army transmissions, Father. One of their new sidewinders seems to have fallen into some kind of underground fire. Thunderbirds had all the landmarks that made Super Marionation memorable. Of course, there were the cool spaceships, but also the sweating puppets, the bleeding puppets, and the smoking puppets. Every so often, one of the characters would walk a few steps, a walk lampooned by kids all around the world. Are you insinuating I'm drunk? By the smell of liquor in this car, I'd say it all had enough. The Thunderbirds was followed by Captain Scarlet and the Mysterians. And if you were as drunk as these puppets, you might think you were watching real people. Very lifelike. The Andersons were now at a point where Super Marionation took another giant step forward. The marionettes were fired and replaced by human actors for shows like UFO and Space 1999. What is it? Auto-hypnosis. The Daily Mail had this to say about the change, quote, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson used to make this space stuff with puppets. With Martin Landau and Barbara Bain, I swear you won't be able to tell the difference, end quote. The latest twist in the super marionation craze is a stage play called The Thunderbirds Fab, The Next Generation, where actors get up on stage and they wobble around doing their best impressions of the super marionation walk. Time to disconnect, but next week the buzz will be about vampire films rising from the dead and multiplying in theaters. And we'll view 100 years of science fiction art with renowned artist Vincent DeFate. I'm Mike Jarek. Pass the buzz along.